I want to talk a bit about uh, Pimp Your Pi, Pi being the Raspberry Pi, which was uh, touched on earlier here. And um, a lot of people have been talking about it, and some people still don't really know how to get started with it. There's a lot of interesting information going about it. Um, so I think we have a cool little solution for it. My name is Nicholas Balmer. I work for Genuatech. Um, so I'm quite into technology. Uh, I think the Internet of Things is really cool. There's a lot of interesting things that are going to happen. So uh, I think we have some interesting times ahead, see how things develop and everything. Um, but before I continue, obviously, you can see that I have my nice shirt on here with my logo. Uh, Genuatech is a commercial company. We make uh, commercial solutions for uh, Eclipse users. However, at my Eclipse Secure Delivery Center uh, are best known products. However, today is about open source uh, and how we can give back to the community. And uh, you'll find everything on GitHub, for example. Um, but in any case, it's about open source, Eclipse, and how we can bring these things together. So I'll be talking about a tool called PyPlug. I'm going to talk a bit about how it was built, what it consists of, uh, some do's and don'ts, show you a little demo of how it works, uh, and how you can use it with uh, the Raspberry Pi. So to start off, we have two elements here, the Raspberry Pi and we have Eclipse. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with both of them. I hope at least you're familiar with Eclipse. Um, I think Eclipse, you know, it's, it's not just an IDE, it's also a very rich framework, it has a lot, of, a lot of services, a lot of stuff you can do with it. You know, it has Equinox, um, which is a pretty neat runtime. You know, we have things like Concierge coming out, very, so quite active open source community, so a lot of cool stuff happening. And then we also have Raspberry Pi, which is I think seen an enormous um, growth in popularity recently. And so, you know, it's like, it's like we talked earlier, it's a simple board there. And I think one of the cool things that you can do with the Raspberry Pi is that you can measure stuff. So we talked about temperature, there's other cool stuff that you can measure with it. Uh, and the idea is then as well, well, how can we translate that into something with a visualization? How can we use our Eclipse knowledge and make it something useful for uh, the Raspberry Pi? Uh, to give you an example, um, I think for a lot of hobbyists, so, you know, like me a little bit, if you like to tinker around with technology, but you're not a hardcore tech guy, you know, this is, for example, a nice little solution. So you bought, bought the Raspberry Pi for 30, 40 bucks, whatever it is. You want to measure the temperature, you wrote an app for the Raspberry Pi, and then you want to project it onto uh, a display, be it a TV or something like that, impress your guests and uh, whatever. I think that's kind of where uh, PyPlug uh, comes in. And PyPlug is something that a couple of colleagues uh, developed in their free time, uh, something to give back to the, to the community. Uh, and it's basically, it's an open source uh, front end. So it allows you to use your uh, Eclipse knowledge, so it's stuff that you know about SWT, uh, JFace, uh, things like that. And um, so JavaFX and things like that as well. And it allows you to uh, use that knowledge and create interesting visualizations for apps that you develop. Um, the PyPlug uh, is then basically there to make your Raspberry Pi as efficient as possible. So while that the Raspberry Pi can do certain things really, really well, sometimes it can be pretty slow to start up. And so we want to try and uh, offer a solution uh, to that. So what do we want to develop? What do we want to enable? Why would you want to use it to start with? Well, the idea is, of course, that you create applications that you can use on uh, your Raspberry Pi. Uh, An application can be all kinds of things. It can be a set of OCI bundles, set of services, anything that you can think of. And so the PyPlug is there to allow you to create that visualization for the app that you create. Um, I have some examples which I'm going to show you uh, in a minute and kind of talk about what works and what doesn't work. Uh, in any case, what doesn't work is if you try to load uh, a full Eclipse IDE uh, onto the Pi. Uh, we tried it. It takes about 10 minutes to load up. Um, even if you try to overclock it, you'll still come in at a whopping eight minutes to get it up and running. So obviously, we need to have something that's a bit more responsive. I thought what Benjamin was showing earlier, working with Orion, was actually a pretty cool uh, solution. But if you just want to kind of use a standard, regular Eclipse that you download off Eclipse.org, you might want to try a, a different solution. Um, before I get into showing you what it looks like, um, just want to talk a bit about the architecture. Architecture is maybe a bit of a, <laughs> a big word. It's not that complicated. Um, but we have three parts. Uh, we have the daemon, which is, runs in the center, and that's your repository for your bundles for the apps that you want to create. And the, and the daemon is there to then service uh, all the Raspberry Pis that you may have running in your home. It runs it into the, um, into the Equinox uh, container that you may have, for example, 
and just make sure that it works. Um, it sends out a UDP uh, broadcast to kind of let the two other parts, which is the deploy view and we have the front end. And it lets everyone know, like, look, hey, I'm here. I have a set of bundles. You know, why don't you come check it out? And then the front end, which you see to the right, which is loaded onto the pies, will then check with the daemon what apps do you have, what bundles do you have, download them, load them in. And then we have uh, the deploy view, which is there to kind of make it easy for you to load those bundles, down, uh, load those apps into, um, into the daemon. And, it, and, the bun and the deploy view is also useful, for example, if you want to, if it doesn't detect a daemon, it will start up the daemon for you, so it's there to make uh, life as easy as possible. So I'll give you uh, an example uh, of what it looks like. Uh, so to keep in mind, I have my laptop here. Uh, running out of battery here, in any case. Um, we have uh, regular Eclipse uh, running on my computer here, and then you would have a Raspberry Pi. Uh, for the sake of this demonstration, I don't have the Raspberry Pi hooked up because I want to just make things smooth and as fast as possible. But the three parts I talked about, you have your deploy view, you have your daemon running on your computer, you would have the front end with the dependencies running on your Raspberry Pi, and that's how you get started. So, um, show you what it looks like. Hope you can see it. Oh, there you go. So what you see now here is uh, the front end, and this is a simple RCP application. It consists of about 15 bundles or so, so it's pretty lightweight. Again, the idea is that we have something very responsive for you to, uh, to work with. Um, and so what you saw, hold on. So what just happened here, when we look at, when we start up the front end, which would be loaded onto your Pi, um, for example, this is a simple RCP front end that we made called the clock. Nothing fancy, of course. This is just for demonstration purposes. And so what actually happened is we had the front end. When the Pi starts, the front end will load up. And then we'll check with Demon, hey, is anything happening? Do you have any new bundles? So Demon's going to reply, yeah, I have these new bundles. The uh, front end downloads it, loads it up, and it creates like a Eclipse extension point, and then it kind of goes from there. So again, we tried to make the process as simple as possible. Um, the clock that you see here is just a simple SWT composite, so it's just painting onto it very easily. Um, but yeah, and that's it. So I want to talk a bit about, we'll go back, we'll show you some more uh, demos in a minute. Um, I'll go back to the presentation. Talk a bit about the um, the plugins, the apps that you can create for it. Um, we made a few basic assumptions, being that one bundle per application. So each uh, each bundle is an app that you would load into uh, into the front end. So what you do is you simply extend by one extension point uh, to create uh, to determine the life cycle of each app uh, that you have in the front end. Now, if you want, you can add additional services. Uh, but that's not strictly necessary. So all the basic clips uh, bundles are there running and are there to help you so you don't have to waste time loading and, and running those things. Um, talk a bit about the, um, the code. So if you would like to develop some of these apps, uh, obviously this is the, uh, the interface that you would have to develop uh, or implement. It's pretty straightforward, so even someone like me was not too technical. It was actually a very interesting way to get used to Eclipse and start working with it a little bit. Um, but it consists of a couple of methods, and we'll go through them really fast. Uh, we have installed, obviously, so this is called when the front end detects a new bundle or app on the daemon, loads it in, and uh, installs it into the uh, OSGI runtime. We have prepare, which is used to create the composite, so that's all the things, so the widgets that you want to create in the front end and things like that, that's what you need it for. We have resume, which I think is one of the more interesting ones. So this allows you to create the background threads, the background activities, animations, things like that. Um, it also allows you to start using the pause resume functionality that you might want to implement in an application. And so 
It's called at the beginning of your app when you enter it for the very first time. And then after you do a suspend and then you go back into the app, it will be called again. So the suspend method as well, that's there to stop the background thread. So any kind of animations that you, background things you have using, have running. And the reason, it's just kind of the same thing that you would have on a mobile phone, right? So once you use an application, you stop using it, you want to close it down because you don't want it using a battery power or any kind of processing power. And then shutdown, uh, lastly, when we want to simply unload the bundle, we want to clear all the references, clear it out. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, apparently, it's a little bit more complicated to do uh, in the regular Eclipse ID environment. However, in these lightweight environments, like with the Raspberry Pi, it's actually pretty straightforward, pretty simple to do. Um, when we talk a little bit about performance and optimization for these devices, because we have to take into consideration the Pi is a pretty lightweight environment. I think the specs are like somewhere around 700 megahertz processing, 256 to 512 megabytes of memory, something like that. And so you have to take this lightweight environment into consideration. And so you might be asking things, oh, well, why don't we use like metadata out of the bundles or something like that? And the thing is though, when we try to optimize it for performance, we notice that whenever you try to load or activate jar files, it actually starts to slow things down. So you have to have a bit of a different approach. And so the idea is that you have to get the bundles, the apps, you have to get them ready for the user so then you can he can interact with all the different ones that you have. Um, so what we, the solution is kind of what we have running is we have a shared Equinox container and the Equinox container is simply there to allow the plugins to, to function. And so by dynamically being able to deploy these apps into this container, we'll actually notice a much faster uh, interactivity with, with these things. So we'll have another uh, demonstration. Uh, I'll show you a little bit with some more apps. So remember, this is the front end which is still running now. Uh, I'm gonna deploy, um, let's see. I'm gonna deploy a few more apps, uh, a few games that uh, my colleagues managed to port over. So Snake. And Zork, I don't know if anyone's heard of Zork before, but it used to be a pretty popular game. And so when I switch back to, oh, sorry. So when I switch back, usually you would, the refreshing rate would be a bit faster. Um, but so I just deployed it. A deployment is basically here a, a PDE export. It's nothing fancy. Um, and so we have these two uh, apps here. So the first one is Sork, and we just ported this over to SWT. Uh, has anyone ever played Zork? Have you ever, has anyone ever heard of it? No, it was uh, pretty popular. So you, the idea is it's a puzzle game, you solve mysteries, and you type in, you wanna go north, you're facing this, or you wanna go south, open, window, things like that, then you just go on and go on and go on. So, what I'm trying to point is I'm gonna show you Snake as well, and so each app can obviously have different kind of usage uh, characteristics. Yes, I wanna quit, and so I'm out. Snake, so if anyone's ever had a Nokia phone in the 90s, you've probably played this and spent, wasted countless hours on it. Uh, in any case, what we have going, we have different kinds of background uh, threads running here for the animation, also doing the math to kind of figure out, okay, where's this bird, uh, putting in these different kind of things. And so when I go out of this app, and I go back in, you'll notice that I go back to exactly the same place as it was before. So this is simply to illustrate uh, as the um, assets get frozen and suspended and simply brought back up again when I go back into the app. And so the idea again is that you can create different kinds of um, life cycles in, in an application. Um, the reason why I'm showing this is obviously very simple, um, but the idea is that you can create much more interesting applications for the Raspberry Pi, keeping this responsiveness into consideration. And you know, when you start connecting it up to your TV, you can do things with like measuring temperature, creating a news feed, anything to kind of want to impress guests, whatever it is. Uh, and I think that's what's so cool about the Raspberry Pi is it allows you to interact with these uh, different um, devices that you may have uh, around your house. So going back to presentation here. Uh, so we talked a bit about optimization, talked a bit about performance and what's important. Um, the snake game which you just saw was not, probably not the most efficient thing. We just wanted to make something to kind of illustrate uh, how things work. 
And so, for example, it's not very efficient, so what happens is the UI gets repainted every single turn, every single time. So, yes, we could have done it a bit more efficient, but what's interesting to note about it is, is that the Pi is actually remarkably good at rendering. Um, by contrast, my colleagues were also trying to develop a uh, kind of also very lightweight, simple application that was good at like finding the contestants or the winners of some kind of a raffle or anything like that. And so they thought, well, instead of rendering a background, let's just load a PNG image file and just use it like that. And then when they tried to load it for the first time, it took about 37 seconds to load the app. And it was like, okay, what's happening? And then after looking into it, it turns out that this PNG file was what's holding everything up. And simply by dropping the resolution a bit and scaling things up, we were able to optimize uh, the performance a lot. So what I simply want to illustrate with this uh, example is that things you take for granted when you're developing in for Eclipse in a regular user environment, it might not necessarily apply for uh, the Pi or any other type of uh, ARM or these low-level uh, ARM devices. So just keep that in mind when doing it. Uh, other very important issue um, which we'd like to talk about is Java 8. Um, I don't know, I don't think the full release is out yet, but if you can get your hands on a pre-release, it's really worth it. It has a lot of optimizations for ARM devices. Uh, ARM devices are devices like the Raspberry Pi and, and, and whatnot. Um, so in some cases, we saw that in certain functions that Java 8 actually managed to improve performance by like up to 30%. So it's definitely very interesting. Same goes for Java X. It has a lot of uh, optimizations uh, for ARM, and so well worth uh, looking into. Uh, some idiosyncrasies, so some things that are a little bit strange if you're coming from an Eclipse uh, background. So uh, the operating system that would run on a Raspberry Pi is something called Raspbian, uh, which is a version of Linux. And so I'm definitely not a Linux uh, guy. However, um, you have SOs uh, there. Um, and so they're embedded in the module. And so what happens is when you're developing and using the latest version of SWT, but you have an older version in the module, how does that work? How do those two things work together? It's a little bit strange. Um, another error that we seem to be getting was uh, render missing, uh, something you can simply ignore. Uh, we weren't able to find any useful information about it uh, online, so if you have any suggestions or any tips, we'd like to know it, but in any case, it's nothing to uh, hold you back. So last demonstration I'm going to do, uh, and I want to touch upon this deployment uh, thing that I showed you earlier. Um, as you saw, so let's take the example of the clock. Um, when, you, when you start developing for the Pi, it may be a little bit um, you know, easier or self-evident to start you know, doing remote debugging, things you might be used to from before. However, we notice again that these type of things tend to create a bottleneck and slow things down. So again, you have to change your thinking a little bit about how you uh, develop it. Uh, so because we try to optimize for efficiency and, and speed, the idea is that you should be able to deploy your applications pretty quickly, as I just showed you before. And then you should be able to continue redeploying them all the time. So what that means is you see the clock here. I go to Eclipse, for example. I want to change the face to blue. Save, and then I redeploy. I go back, right, and it changes. And so what you see here, these quick refreshes, what that basically is, it's actually a full OSGI uh, transfer. So what happened was the Pi was checking, okay, you know, sending out uh, a UDP beacon and going like, okay, where's the daemon? Then the front end connects to the laptop, checks, okay, are there any new bundles? What are the bundles? It downloads them, stalls them, uh, loads them into the Equinox uh, runtime, and then you have an immediate refresh. Same thing if I would do it one more time. If we go to, let's say, thin, and we want to go for a thick one. And we go back, deploy it. There we go. Oh, well, it's not working now. <laughs> Uh, but again, the idea being that uh, you should be able to deploy, make changes, redeploy it very, very fast. And so this is kind of this reiterative programming. And oh, there you go, it's changed now. So you can do this reiterative programming. So you kind of change your mind a bit about how you debug, but you make it very simple, changes, redeploy, and, and there you go. So it's actually a pretty nice way for you to prototype out your 
uh, OSGI bundles that you're working on and just work, continue working uh, like that. Um, to go back to presentation, uh, to start finishing up, uh, I know everyone's getting kind of hungry probably. Uh, if you're interested in playing around with it, we have everything up on, on GitHub. Uh, you find the URL right there. Uh, in Eclipse, you just have to install the view, uh, get the um, get a download a couple of the app uh, sample apps if you want to as well, and then get the front end onto your Raspberry Pi, including some of its dependencies. Start playing around with it, run it. You know, if you have any contributions, we'd love to see it on uh, GitHub. Um, and to sum up now, to round up, I think coming back to the IoT, I mean, obviously, as we saw today, there's been a lot of focus on it. Um, I think also at EclipseCon North America, we saw a lot of tracks, a lot of talks about it. And I think it's going to pose a lot of challenges and it's going to be a lot of opportunities. I mean, some of these apps you saw, you, all the cool stuff, you can kind of reinvent existing devices you have at home, your TV, your lighting circuit, your garage door, anything you want, you can kind of transform it a little bit. Um, now, the Raspberry Pi is kind of cool, but it's not very robust. So, you know, it's great for a hobbyist, play around with it at home. But I'm sure as things will uh, pro, uh, evolve, it will get more uh, interesting. I think one of the challenges, and this is something at Genuitech that we try to focus on a bit as well, and something called security. Uh, I saw an article, was it uh, yesterday, on uh, Wired. I don't know if you heard of it, but the Internet of, Internet of Things, uh, there were some stories about, um, for example, home routers being infected by a worm and then creating a big botnet through that. Uh, another example was um, security cameras, or security DVRs. Um, being infected and then turned into Bitcoin mining devices, which I thought was actually pretty clever, but obviously very illegal. Um, so obviously security is a pretty big point. And to that effect, we also have Cisco, for example, they're like uh, offering, I think around $300,000 in grants with the question, okay, what does security mean in this context? Um, you know, we have two sides of the coin. One is like a cable modem you might get from your internet provider, which is just one box, you're not allowed to enter it, it does one thing, it belongs to one party, and that's it. Now, can we still consider that to be Internet of Things? I don't know. The other, so other way is a lot of people, hobbyist people at home working with these Raspberry Pis, and then, for example, um, you know, using it to measure temperature, collecting traffic information, things like that, and then everything working together, which I think is actually a pretty neat uh, effect. However, the question then is, who owns the data? Who's responsible? Uh, is it the owner of the device? Is it the developer of the device? You know, there's a difference between running it at home versus running it in a public, in public space. So I think we still have a lot of questions about security which we need to answer. Uh, I know we've tried to do it for uh, Eclipse in general with Secure Delivery Center, one of our products. And so that kind of allows you to set download policy, you know, when you roll out new software to who, things like that. So I think we've achieved that with regular Eclipse. However, with the Internet of Things, with all these things happening, I think it's still a big open question. So, in any case, that's that. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear it. If not, you want to talk about it afterwards, feel free to come up to me. Um, but yeah, thank you for your time. <laughs>